Hello, everyone, and inside the latest Locked On Canadians, there's a bunch of new dudes. Who are they? Your Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 1084 of Locked On Canadians, your daily Montreal Canadiens podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where you get your team every single day of the week. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Remember to make every moment more right now because new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 with any winning $5 bet. Just visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started and you may be wondering who is this guy talking to me if you're new here i am one of your hosts i am scott matla and as always i am joined by my fantastic co-host the active stick laura saba and laura we got actual news today it it mostly news today one (laughs) real news one hypothetical news and other stuff here uh how are you doing today Uh, i was literally i think kent hughes read our mind I, i was going to text you saying, what are we going to talk about tonight? Um, so I think I think we got a little lucky, and I'm excited to dive into it. Yes. Uh, just to break down the show for folks in advance, if for whatever reason uh, you want to just fast forward to a certain part to think about things or talk about things, whatever, uh, we're going to talk about two of the new uh, additions to the Canadians roster, one coming to development camp and one who has signed an actual uh, NHL deal and one who... Uh, and just in the last segment, we just want to kind of vamp a little bit on some of the thoughts we've seen around the fan base. Uh, but let's just jump right into the new thing and meet one of the new guys. And this is one I'm actually very I'm was surprised that came out of uh, out of free agency here because this is a name that bounced around last year during draft season and going into this off season. Uh, and that is a Josh Nadeau who is uh, coming out of the University of Maine from San Francois de Madawaska, New Brunswick, Canada, <laughs> which I just wanted to prove that I could say that. Can I pronounce Laval correctly? Can I pronounce <laughs> that? Uh, he comes from the University of Maine. He is the brother of Hurricane's first round pick, Bradley Nadeau. He's 20 years old, coming off a 45 point and 37 game season for the Maine Bears. Uh, five foot eight, 160 pounds, 20 years old, uh, as a winger, left winger, right winger. He's first tile on either one here. And I gotta say, for someone getting invited to development camp, we're early on this. I know we're about a month out from when development camp starts, but like this feels really early to be hearing about other camp invites that weren't already on the roster right now. And I gotta say, if they're gonna go for it, this is the kind of guy I would take a swing at because just before this. And uh, this NCAA season he had at Maine, he put up 110 points in 54 games in the BCHL playing for Penticton, uh, I believe, alongside his brother there. I know he's a little bit older, uh, but I got to say, if you're going to go for a guy to bring him to camp, I'd rather see skill and scoring than, hey, maybe he's a bottom six forward on an AHL team kind of stuff. Right. It's like this feels like a low risk, high reward situation. Um, and it really, it really has to do with whether or not he's able to achieve the promise that he comes with or the, what the Canadians saw in him. And often I find that even with trade targets, not just signings or invitations, or I'll find that like Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon have an eye on a guy. They like the guy, they want the guy. I'm not sure about the guy, but for whatever reason, they see something in that person, right? And, you know, we can go from Emil Heinemann to New Hook to whatever it is. So for, for me, from my perspective, I'm I'm intrigued and curious. I'm not positive or negative, but I, I am interested. Yeah, and here's the thing is that, uh, like, Bradley Nadeau is going to get all of, is the biggest thing in all of this is going to be, hey, what about your brother? Hey, what about your brother? Hey, what about your brother? And uh, as I've learned from Ryan Suzuki, uh, players hate that (laughs) Uh, in one way, shape, or form. He did not like being asked about his brother so often at the Combine. I'm really excited to see. And here's the thing. I'm not under the impression that he's going to come in and immediately be a superstar uh, on this team. I am not under that impression. But when I look at a guy who 
puts up points at every level he's played at. Obviously, some of those years were hampered a little bit uh, by COVID, playing in maybe leagues that he normally wouldn't be in, going out to the BCHL because maybe the NCA wasn't operating at that time, at least not at full capacity, and this was the opportunity for him. All he's done is just put up points at every single level there. 30 points in 27 games, 40 points in 32, 56 and 35, uh, 6 and 7 in a league promotion, 31 and 15, 72 and 54, 110 in 54, 45 and 37, and then also a pretty solid looking playoff performer. We talk a lot about how Jared Davidson, maybe despite being an overage guy, might be maybe being a little bit smaller, has the effort and uh, drive to make things happen. Just this quote here uh, on his Elite Prospects page, Nadeau's creativity and elusiveness are truly remarkable. Josh is one of the best players I've ever seen play the game at his age. Obviously, that's from four years ago. Uh, so he would have been, you know, 16 years old at the time. Clearly, they see something in him, and I assume they saw a lot of him at Maine when watching uh, Hudson and watching Fowler and watching Tuck and watching these guys in the NCAA that clearly Maine did something right here. That And there's something that Kent Hughes liked in this team. Bradley Nadeau led the team in scoring. Josh Nadeau was right behind him. There, there were two draft picks on this entire team. One of them is Bradley, and the other one was a goaltender. This is not exactly a Hockey East team loaded to the brim with talent. But if you're making stuff happen without having to rely on other people, I'd say you're doing a pretty good job. And now the question is, can he play away from his brother? Because he also... <laughs> and Tickton team there where his brother put up 113 points. He put up 110 and then Adar Suniev, who was drafted by the flames. I believe last year put up 90 points. Can he play away from him? This is just an, it's a really interesting bet. And I, the first thing people go on, like just what they need another small guy. Like I one- hate that argument. I hate that reaction all the time. And I'm not seeing this because I'm a short person. I am a short person at a hundred percent. But for me, like, like this is the NHL is constantly evolving. And the more it evolves, the more it favors pure skill and speed. Right. And I'm not saying size is not important. I'm saying that you can't have a team of only small players for sure. I'm saying that small should not be a knock on the guy because it's all about the team composition. It's all about how they complement each other. It's all about how they play. It's all about how hard it is to move them off the puck, how hard it is to separate them from the play, how hard it is to, to play against them, right? How hard it is to defend against them. That's the biggest thing. And so for me, like when people say another small guy, I just think like, can you please at least give this a chance? Also, another small guy, like the most exciting defensive prospect we've had in a decade, isn't barely five foot nine and a half. Like the one of the best pure goal scorers this team's ever had isn't five foot seven. You know, it's I don't know how we keep getting stuck in this cycle of they're too small, but also then they immediately want to trade Arbor Jack and Josh Anderson away. You, you can't have your cake and eat it. You got to find the balance here. Right. And no one is saying this is going to be a player who's going to hit the NHL right away. Or ever. Or, we don't know. And that's the thing is, this is just, it's a camp invite. And it's got y'all so hot and bothered and not in a good way that, you know, I don't know what to tell you. This is the kind of risk, though, that you go, hey, did they perform well in development camp? You bring them into, you know, rookie camp and training camp when they start getting ready for, uh, the rookie showcase, which I believe is not happening this year in Buffalo for the Habs. I believe they're hosting just a few games at the Bell Center because I don't know. I'm kind of upset by that. But you, this is the kind of guy that you keep an eye on and you bring in for that. And if the fit is right, you give him an AHL deal at the end of it. Or maybe it's an NHL deal. Who knows? It could be a one-year entry-level deal that all works out. Uh, however, Josh Dodeau is not the only uh, roster news of the day. Canadians surprised all of us, Lauren, myself included, with a move from Switzerland. And we're getting into that coming up next. First, as I said off the top of the show, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. And honestly, it is the perfect time to get into 
uh, with the NBA and the NHL in uh, their finals. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and more. Can Connor McDavid finally do it? Can Florida avenge their finals defeat next year? You can bet on anything uh, in that series and take home a little bit extra cash and bonus bets afterwards. Just visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to make every playoff shot count with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We are back here at Locked On Canadians, and the Canadians surprised, I think, everyone today because I don't think any of us anticipated anything. Yeah. A, a con- <laughs> yeah. We we knew something would come of the, of the free agent ones like we talked about with Jared Davidson in yesterday's episode, but today was, I think... I, I, I feel bad saying out of left field, but definitely out of left field here is. We were all waiting for things, and then this was none of those things. Yes. The Canadians today signed goaltender Connor Hughes from the, uh, from, pardon me, from the Swiss League. He was playing for Luzon uh, in the National League there. I learned I actually called it the Swiss League on Twitter. The Swiss League is actually the second tier underneath that. And I am currently just trying to determine whether this is an NHL or an AHL I contract. It's two way. I believe it's two way. Yes, Connor Hughes salary would be seven hundred seventy-five thousand. This is for the twenty. He has a two blah blah blah, blah. one-year contract worth that. He'll be a UFA at the end of. Yeah. So as it stands, this is an NHL con. It wasn't very clear because Elite Prospects listed him immediately on the Rocket roster. So I wanted to make sure that one year two way can mean one year AHL two way contract where he can go, uh, where he makes different money at the AHL or ECHL level. And I gotta say, this was not the answer for AHL goaltending that I was expecting in the slightest. I thought for sure maybe Casimir Kaskisua was coming back, but we'll touch on that uh, to kind of give people a look at just the baseline counting stats here. Playing in the National League this year, 19 games, 1.73 goals against, 940 save percentage, two shutouts, 10 6 and 1 record. In the playoffs, 18 games played, 1.91 goals against, 933 save percentage, two shutouts, 11 6 and 1 record. This is a guy who kind of dragged his team to a uh, to a game seven this year, from based on my replies. And in the previous years, he's done a really good job uh, when given the reins at the National League level. Last year, 36 games, 16-11-2, and two, one shutout, 907 save percentage, 2.32 goals against. Uh, before that, two games in the uh, National League, 2-0, and 920 save percentage. He had a kind of a rough start a little bit before that, but as it's gone on, he seemingly has established himself as uh, a solid national national league goaltender there uh i also haven't done the fun part that people want to know but he's six foot four weighs 225 pounds not he's another not a, small guy <laughs> he's not a small dude uh laura before i jump into a thread from a swiss hockey expert here uh your thoughts on what is a surprising addition to this canadians team well for me this makes me question like what is the plan for laval um, because clearly the, the, the player they signed, it's a two-way contract. And like, for me, I feel like the next step is let's say they're shipping out either Caden Primo or Samuel Montambo, so Caden Primo, or let's say, you know, um, who's next in the plan? Is it this guy on the two-way contract or is it time for them to see if Jakob Dobish has what it takes, right? Is this an opportunity or are they just going to do the same thing that they did last year, which is just carry around three goaltenders? Like, that was the thing for me. Like the fact that they sign this guy, they want to bring him over. It feels like very much strongly like a, they want him in Laval move. The fact that like, it doesn't like it came out of no, like there are other people in the system, right? Maybe they want to let them cook longer. Is that, is that, is that what it is? So like, that's why I kind of wanted to ask your opinion on, on this, because for me, I looked at that and I was like, okay, it's clearly a Laval move, but is it a Laval move because Caden Primo slash Dobish or is it just a Laval move because they feel that goaltending this like he was not supported and goaltending was one of the reasons the beginning of the season did not go well for Laval 
I think it's two things is that one, they now have four NHL contracted goaltenders, <laughs> two in Laval, two in Montreal. Uh, in Montreal, which is important. Now they have a balance there. Last year, they just had Dobish on his NHL deal in the minors that if they needed a call up, they could not call up anybody else and left the rocket kind of between a rock and a hard place here. Uh, it's not that I don't think they thought Casimir Kaskiso was the guy either. I don't think that he, they thought he was the guy worthy of an NHL contract. I thought Kaskiso was a very good fit on that team. I just look at this and think they gave him an NHL deal, paid him, you know, league minimum on this, that if we need somebody to come up and sit on the bench at the NHL level, you can do that. He's got pro experience is the thing. Like he played in the Swiss league. It's not like it's nothing. It's not, you know, Sweden. It's not quite Finland. It's not uh, the NHL as a whole, but you could do a lot worse. And the thing is, is that, like you said, this is now someone who can support Jakob Dobish there as well. He's 27 years old. This is not, I would not call this player a prospect. Uh, this is a guy who's, you know, he played a lot of junior A and stuff bouncing around in Canada and then went right to Switzerland. He didn't play in regular junior. He didn't play in the CHL, didn't play in the NCAA. He bounced around the OJHL, the CCHL, uh, and then went to Switzerland and has been there for seven years. Uh, and this is a thread from uh, Thibaut Chatel, who does a lot of uh, Swiss tracking for uh, players playing in Switzerland. He's like the source for things on David Reinbacher questions right now, for sure. And definitely Vincennes Roars is playing that. Uh, Hughes became a starter early in 22-23 in Freiburg and did so. He was signed by Luzon in December of 2023 for the following season, despite a small sample of games. And then he jumped into being their full-time starter, leading them to game seven of the NL finals this past year. He was coached by former Montreal Canadiens goaltender Cristobal Huey. And he was the best in the National League for goals saved in 23-24. The best at 5-on-5 five five and the seventh best goalie on the penalty kill. There's a whole thread. I quoted it on the Lockdown Canadiens account. I highly recommend you follow this. Very good against the rush. Rebounds coming across the Royal Road. Crease to crease kind of things there. And efficient in front of his crease that he's not moving too much. He, does, he pushes the puck away well, solid on the blocker side, can improve his glove work and along the ice level. He's a big guy. He might get caught kind of standing up a little bit sometimes. It looks like he's getting beat low to mid glove a little bit, which is something that can be worked on. This is someone that I think the Canadians got a viewing of watching Reinbacher in Switzerland in the past couple of years. And I think that this is probably one of the smarter ads they could have made right now. It's about as low risk as you can get. You don't have to worry about him usurping uh, Jakob Dobish and letting him continue his development. But if your young netminder needs a break, you have a guy who seemingly can handle it pretty well right now. Yeah, and that's the thing. I think both moves today are like extremely low risk. I, I guess in the case of Nedo, it's like pretty much zero risk, right? Um, and then potential high reward here. Uh, and again, like, I feel like for, for my money, you know, at the end of the season, I don't think that Caden Primo is still going to be on the Montreal Canadiens. And that's just my feeling. I could be completely wrong. As, as someone said to me, so I think I was talking to Jared book about this, then I'm like, what if they trade Primo? We really don't have an NHL backup. It's potentially easier to just find an NHL backup than it is to, you know, try to run the, the three goalie system. And I'm actually going to take a look at free agent players going into this off season. Cause I haven't done that. And I realized that I should have before I started this. And I'm very interested to see who is available in here. This is currently the list. This includes some RFAs as well. Uh, Matt Murray coming off a of hip surgery, Carter Hart suspended Ilya Samsonov bad Chris Dreger, uh coming off a system there. Uh, Jeremy Swayman, RFA Capo Kakinen. Kevin Lankin and Casey DeSmith again, Eric Comrie, Lauren Brossois, Alex Nadelkovich, James Reimer, Antti Ranta, Phoenix Copley, Anthony Stolar, Scott Wedgwood, Cam Talbot, Mad Sogard, who's an RFA, 
Mac goes to, and now we're just into people that I'm not sure are actually real. Well, there's a lot of people there that I'm surprised are even still around. <laughs> yeah, there's like, I look at this and it's like, there's some backup guys that you could get if you decided to move on from Caden Primo in this. Could you bring in Lauren Perswat and have him be a, a fine backup to Kate or uh, Samuel Montembeau? Sure. Could you do that with Capo Kakinen? Maybe, but also he played on some bad teams. Is he worth it? Uh, a Chris Dreger maybe, but he also had surgery last year, I believe, that kept him mm -hmm. out most of the year. Or are you going to pay for someone like Ilya Samsonov potentially? Right. Uh, this to me just is, it's a shrewd move. It doesn't have to be earth shatteringly good or anything like that. I, to me, this is just, you know, it's a nice little bit of an it's ad there. Yeah. It's a um, thing they did. Yes. And it's not exactly a, what I would call a splash by mm -hmm. any means here. However, we are going to talk about that because it's going around. Do the Canadians really need to go and spend a bunch this off season? We're going to discuss that coming up next. We are back here at Locked On Canadians. And I saw an article out there today saying the Canadians have to make a splash this offseason because Nick Suzuki is doing everything. And Uri Slavkovsky isn't there yet. And Cole Caulfield is inconsistent. And then they talked about literally nothing else on this team. Uh Ignoring the fact that, you know, Mike Matheson put up 60 points last year or that. What's that guy got to do to get some respect? Uh, play on a team that wins, apparently. So I dropped my phone next to my laptop there. So that's always good podcasting. I thought that was anger. No, no <laughs> I thought I you were throwing something like as in like flipping the table. Oh, God, no. Too expensive to do that. And then I got to <laughs> clean it up. But. My question is, Laura's, does Kent Hughes actually need to make a splash this offseason? I look at the way the Canadians were set up in that they played this entire year without their second line center, basically. And people are like, well, Nick Suzuki can't do it all. Yeah, he had to it's last true. year because, <laughs> because he had no second line center for most of the year. Is adding Kirby Dock in and getting a full season of Alex Newhook potentially enough to to, to make this a, 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 a splash, so to speak. We know Kent Hughes likes his off season trades, but does he need to give up the farm to make that happen at this point when he's going to get his center back uh, for training camp? I absolutely don't think so. So for me, I think it, it depends on context, right? Like I would love to see Kent Hughes make a splash at the NHL draft in a good way to get a player that is, you know, somebody that we can all get excited about not feel safe with but get excited about that is where i want to see the splash but in terms of like trying to get help like in terms of free agency etc cetera, etc cetera, this is not the year to do it this is not a situation where right now there's a guy who's like young enough that really wants to leave his team that's testing free agency etc cetera, etc cetera. Like, and the Canadians are a couple years away from being good enough for us to be feel comfortable calling them contenders, right? It's okay. There's no rush. Like for me, from my perspective, I want to see the Canadians succeed. I want them to put a solid building blocks in place. Right now, you're not really gaining anything by making a splash because more often than not, that making a splash part, it comes with a huge cap hit. So unless you would consider being able to get rid of Josh... Uh, Anderson's contract easily that's the kind of splash that I would be on board with or you know a draft splash I really don't think that this season it's not that he never needs to make one it's that this season is early for this like it's not a need it's not a requirement it would be fun it's just not now's not the best time for it let's say like let's let's be very clear here if the Montreal Canadiens decide yeah we want Trevor Zegras. Excuse my dog sneezing in her crate behind me. Yes, we want to add Martin Natchez. We want to trade for unknown player that's going to come out of nowhere that nobody saw coming. I am not opposed to them making a deal. I want to be very clear on that. If they want to go and make a splash, hell yeah. I will support you in that if the pricing is right on that. Do I think they absolutely have to right now? I am not 100% sold on that idea. Yes, adding these players is great, but are you in a position where adding this player will get you over the hump that you need? 
you still have a young and developing defensive group here. You have a solid but not spectacular goaltending duo. Who knows what Caden Primo will look like this year. You do need some offensive depth there and getting guys like Doc back. Are you willing to shell out to get the Natchez, Zegris, whomever, to fill that? Or can you continue to budget your cap well, try and move these pieces off, and then when you are ready to get over that hump, go out just guns blazing. When you've gotten the Armia contract off the books, when you have gotten uh, Jeff Petrie's retained salary off the book, Edmondson's retained salary off the book, when you have gotten uh, the Savard contract off the book, if you have potentially traded Josh Anderson, when you have opened up all that space that you can really turn this team into your sandbox and you have these other younger pieces developing, Joshua Wow, will he take that next step? Philip Mashar, Owen Beck, Sean Farrell, any of these guys potentially coming in, have you made that enough progress that if you surround them with just a few, like with another big money piece with Suzuki and Doc and Newhook and Slavkovsky and whatever, then yeah, you go for it. But if you're going to spend and it's not going to get you over the hump, it's like me buying a Ferrari right now. Look at how cool this thing is as I hit a pothole on Main Street Buffalo and go nowhere right now. I'm not saying that, who knows, maybe Nate just gets them over the hump next year. Unless you know for sure that that is the case and they're they're going into the season with, we want to make the playoffs, we want to contend, then I don't see the need to rush and jump into this. And I know everyone's going to be screaming, why wouldn't you want to add good players? Which I say, I don't want to not add good players. I want to add them wet where the timing is right in everything here. Um, and especially I want to see what they do with the NHL draft. Cause that's going to tell me a lot about what does this team need? Right. Do they need wingers. Do they need centers? Do they need defensive depth? What does this team need? Right. And that's the thing, like you said, if a good player is available and can be had, that's one. And they have to be young too. Like that's the thing. Like they have to be young. If, if they can be had, they're available, go for it. Absolutely. But do you need to make a splash? It's not an absolute requirement. Nobody's going to die. If the Canadians do not make a splash in this off season. And it's and all it keeps popping up that the Canadians, the Canadians and Martin Natchez, Kent Hughes doesn't usually let rumblings leak out this much. Uh, no one saw Kirby Doc coming. No one saw Alex Newhook coming. Uh, the amount of people that keep trying to connect Natchez to the Montreal Canadiens, it feels like this is a complete misdirection. He's going to end up somewhere else completely. Which wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't be the first time that, oh, Montreal's in on this leverage to another team. I can see like Kent Hughes making a deal. I don't think it's going to be for anyone that anybody expected here. I don't think it'll be Zegris, and I don't think it'll be Martin Natchez. I'm happy to be wrong on those, you know, assuming they do happen, but there's been too much smoke for it to be Kent Hughes's MO in that. I would not be surprised if there was something else up his sleeve for a young player on another team that maybe is just looking for a fresh start. Uh, we've and Or if it's someone that, you know, is a veteran that just wants to move elsewhere from a team that isn't getting where it needs to. Uh, but with where I'm at on this is I don't think they have to make the big splash this off season. If they do super cool. And I'm all about it. Uh, Laura, do you have any parting thoughts for our listeners today? No, that was it for me. Uh, we will be back tomorrow. We may have player reviews. Maybe we'll have more signings to talk about. We should probably like preview our rooting interests in like the Stanley Cup final at some point. But who knows? We will let you know what's coming up tomorrow uh, in our newest episode. Until then, follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians. Canadians at gmail.com if you have mailbag questions. We are free and available wherever you get your daily podcasts. Google, Apple, Spotify, or here on YouTube.com. Follow Laura at the Active Stick. Follow myself at Scott Matla, and we will see you all next time.